Good morning. Thank you, girls. Uh, two weeks ago, we started a series on prayer that I said was going to be a four-week study, uh, but I've decided to make this a three-week study in order to give us more time for what we're going to do next, uh, which is going to be a series through First Peter that will take us all the way up until Easter. So we're going to cut one week short on this series. I hope that's okay, and if it's not okay, then send me an angry email or something. <laughs> so today we're going to finish our study of prayer. We talked about uh, the importance of prayer at the beginning, and uh, we had a a kind of heart-to-heart about repenting of our prayerlessness, and then we talked about some common hindrances to prayer and what can be done about them, and today I want to talk about the content of our prayer. So as we do that, let me start us with a prayer, if you would pray with me. Our Father, uh, as we come now to the end of our study on prayer, we stop and remember who it is that we pray to. We remember that you are the creator of everything that we can see and hear and touch and everything that we can't, that all power uh, comes from you and is accountable to you. Uh, We remember you, Jesus. We remember that you are our master, our Lord, and that you save us, that you save us once and then you continue to save us. We remember that you entered our story and that you suffered and that you died. And and we believe and we confess that you are alive right now and that you're coming again. And Spirit, we we remember you. We remember that you mark us for our salvation, that you forgive us of our sins, that you unite us to, uh, to yourself and to the church, and that you will one day give life to our mortal bodies. Uh, Lord, we acknowledge to you that our prayers are often uh, meager and short-sighted, and uh, even self-absorbed. And we ask that you would please forgive us for that. Please teach us to pray today. Teach us to pray for one another and teach us to pray for those who don't know you. Please make us into a people of prayer. Our Father, we ask these things by the authority of your Son, Jesus, and in the power of your Spirit. And all the church says. In the book of Acts, chapter 4 we read where some of the apostles have been persecuted for talking about Jesus and healing in Jesus' name. And so a couple of them have been singled out and they've been beaten, which I think is kind of an odd thing to do to someone. Punish, a way of punishing them for healing is to hurt them. It just seems like maybe you need to be more creative. But when the scourging is over, they come back to the church And they tell the church what has happened, and the church prays together. And this is the first record that we have of the church praying together. We have these comments about they would pray, but this is the first like recorded prayer of the church. And it starts in verse 23. That's where I'm going to pick up. Acts 4, verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them, that they should stop talking about Jesus. And when they, the church, heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, quote, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. End quote. That's Psalm 2. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, 
to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. That is, Psalm 2 is now being fulfilled. The kings and the rulers of the earth are now gathered together against your Holy One, Jesus. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. When I read this story, something in it just resonates with me. There's something about this that makes me say, yes, like that. That's a prayer if I ever heard one. And then the room is shaken and the spirit fills them and they go out recharged to preach the gospel. There is something rich and something gritty and something supernatural about this prayer. And when I read this, it just seems like it's such a far cry from please help Aunt Edna's hip to feel better. If you've ever sat through a prayer meeting, then you probably know what I'm talking about. Can I show you something that made me laugh? The answer better be yes, because you know what's coming. Okay, I want to show you something that made me laugh. It's like a Mad Lib prayer request generator. Okay, so... My blank, obscure relative, uh, great aunt, brother-in-law, third cousin, we'll just pick brother-in-law, their acquaintance, next door neighbor, junior high soccer coach, Twitter follower, we'll say next door neighbor, Uh, their vehicle, pet, body part is, and then something's wrong with it, just pray that God would just really do something to it or the situation. My brother-in-law's next-door neighbor's cat is lost. Just pray that God would just really uh, help the situation. How many of you have heard those prayer requests before? How many of you read that and go, yep, (laughs) I've sat through that prayer meeting before? I think that it's hilarious because whoever made this, and and the people who made this are, this is like coming from within the church. This isn't an unbeliever making fun of the church. This is coming up from within, poking fun at ourselves. (laughs) And it's funny because it's true. It's uncanny how accurate this is. I believe that we often don't know what to pray for. And so when we gather together to pray, whether that's on a Sunday night or in our small group or whenever, if our small group bothers to pray together, then it often becomes a kind of gossip session or a news sharing session. And it goes something like this. We need to pray for so-and-so because they're, uh, they're separated and they're filing for divorce and we just need to pray that God would just really shine his face on the situation. <clears throat> We need to pray for this organization in town. Oh, why? Well, didn't you see what happened to them in the paper? Oh, I didn't hear about that. And you're catching up. And what it is, is we're, just, we're catching up, and we're doing it in the form of a prayer request. And I think that because we're not always sure what to pray for, I think our gut instinct is to gravitate towards certain kinds of prayers. Specifically, health, and travel. And as I think about the, the prayer requests that were taken up this morning, and like this, has happened, this happens all over the country. Uh, this happens week in and week out. Now, is it important to ask the great physician for healing? Yes, of course. And the next time I'm in the hospital, I hope that you're praying for me. I don't want to say that we shouldn't pray for that. And is it appropriate to pray for protection while traveling? Yes, that's absolutely fine. But I think that there's a deeper reason why we gravitate toward health and travel as the lion's share of what happens in these prayer meetings when we pray together. And that is that when the prayer leader has their little piece of paper and they say, do we have any prayer requests? We immediately start scrolling through our minds 
What's, what's happening right now? Do, do I have any friends that need to be prayed for? Do I have any, uh, any co-workers? Or what, what happened yesterday? Oh, something happened this morning. We should talk about that. Or I've got something coming up this week or tomorrow that, that I want to pray for. We start scrolling through our minds thinking about what's going on right now. We're focused on the immediate, the urgent, and the prominent. And let me put it this way. When prayer is dominated, now it can have those things, but when prayer is dominated by short-term, immediate, urgent prayer needs, prayer becomes a form of crisis management. There's a crisis right now, an immediate need. There's a health scare. There's a, uh, somebody's going to be traveling, whatever. And there should be room for crisis management in prayer. But this is my sort of undergirding assumption. This is the first thing that I need you to get this morning, and it's this. Crisis management need not be the bread and butter of our prayers. Now, as soon as I say this, I want to remind us of what we just read in Acts chapter 4. It was a response to something that had just happened. It was a crisis management prayer. It was thinking about what's going on in the life of the church at that very moment. Is there room for crisis management? Yes. But a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Martin Luther. I said that he would pray two hours a day. And how many of you heard two hours a day and went, (laughs) what? Can't even pray an hour, half an hour. What do you do for that much time? Well, I guess you're just supposed to fill it with crisis management. But then we start getting onto ourselves about, well, God's not a genie, he's not a vending machine, and and so I'm not supposed to come to prayer and just, I need this, and I need this, and I need this. So what what is prayer supposed to be filled with? And we're going to look at a lot of New Testament today. We're going to look at passages where people are praying for one another, and we're going to see the kind of things that formed the bread and butter, the lion's share of their prayers. I think we can stand to learn a lot from this. Now, last week when we looked at the uh, hindrances to prayer, I said that there is no universally agreed upon set list of these are the five hindrances to prayer that everybody always has always acknowledged. And, And it's the same thing with this. There is no set universally agreed upon this is the bread and butter of what your prayer ought to be. And everybody has always said so. But we are going to look at a few things. We're going to look at three groups of people to pray for and what we might pray for them. Three groups. First, we pray for our fellow believers. This is exactly what we saw in the Acts 4 story, the church praying for their fellow believers. And it's something that we come across time and time and time again in the New Testament. In the life of Jesus and in the writings of Paul, we see prayer for believers. In fact, if we pay attention to how Paul prayed, I think we'll get a feel for his bread and butter. So I want to show you just a a handful, just a peppering of, of passages where we watch Paul pray. Okay, So Ephesians chapter 1. This is what he says. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in his saints. In Colossians chapter 1, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Colossians chapter 1. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, 
being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. And then one more from 2 Thessalonians. To this end, we always pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power, so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul prays for his fellow believers. And we could have looked at a much longer passage in John 17, where Jesus prays for his believers. This is a good example to us. And so rather than scrolling through our minds, looking for who's in need of help, who has an urgent need, what if we started when we said, who do we need to pray for? What if we started thinking around this room? Most of us tend to sit in the same spot just about every time at this point. Maybe it's easier for me because I get to see y'all, but maybe you start thinking through the room. We start praying for one another. That's the example to us, that we would pray for the people in our church, that we pray for the people in our small group, that we would pray for fellow believers in other churches and in other cities and in other countries. This should be part of our bread and butter, the regular rhythm of our prayers that we pray for each other. Now, what is it that we pray for each other? Do we pray for each other when, when we're sick? Yeah, of course we do. And, and, and when we're traveling, yeah, we just did. But if we could look at the prayers of Paul that we just touched down on, and we could have looked at others, but if we just picked just these four and ask, what are the things that we pray for other believers... What would kind of bubble to the surface? Let me show you a few things that I think we get just from those four verses. And I have, they're in the bulletin, so you can, look at them, you can look them up again if you need to. First of all, we pray for our fellow believers to have wisdom. He says this over and over, multiple times in those few verses. We pray that God would fill our fellow disciples of Jesus with wisdom, with knowledge of his will, that they would know how to conduct themselves as they're going into work, as they are dealing with crisis in their family, as they're trying to figure out how to follow Jesus in the real world, we, we pray that the spirit of wisdom would be on them. Second of all, we pray for our fellow believers to grow in faith and hope and in love. God, I pray for Steve. I pray that this morning as he's going into work, I pray that you will strengthen the resolve of his faith. I pray that you'll keep the hope that he has in you right in front of his eyes as I know he's going to be dealing with customers and and people coming in and giving him grief. I pray that you will fill him with love for you and for the people around him and for your church. What would happen if we started to pray for the faith and the hope and the love of one another? And then third, we pray for our fellow believers to be righteous. And again, I'm just getting these all from the verses that we looked at from Paul. This this doesn't mean that we self-righteously say, I just pray that, uh, I don't know, I need a fake name, Gary, would uh, see the light and start doing what I think he ought to do. Uh, We easily can drift into... This person isn't doing what I think, and so the the righteous thing is for them to do what I think they ought to do. We want to make sure that we don't drift into that, but this means praying that one another, that we would be filled with the fruit of the Spirit, that we would become people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. We pray for each other to be righteous because, frankly, we need all the help we can get. How would your prayers be different if you started praying like this? If if when you hit your knees to to pray, instead of just going through your laundry list of crisis management, if you started every time, I'm going to pray for my church that they would be filled with wisdom and faith and hope and love and righteousness. Every day I'm going to pick somebody different in my group and I'm going to pray for them in these, these three ways or five ways, depends on how you count it. The second group of people that we should pray for are unbelievers. We pray for fellow believers and then we pray for unbelievers. 
And already I've got you thinking, well, what could the third group be? Ha, ha, ha. Okay. <laughs> we pray for those who have not given their allegiance to Jesus, people who do not believe in him, don't know him, don't trust him. And I want you to know if you are not a believer and you're here this morning and you have never been baptized, you've never given your life to Jesus, I want you to know that I have prayed for you this week. I have prayed every day that you would come and that you would know the love of Jesus. Now, I was actually really surprised as I was looking through getting ready for this, how little the Bible actually says about praying for unbelievers. I expected, as I just started digging into it, oh, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff. There's not. There's hardly anything about praying for unbelievers. And there are a couple of reasons for that, I think. And at this point, I just kind of conjecture. But I, I think part of that has to do with the fact that everything we have in the New Testament is one Christian talking to another Christian. The Gospels are written by Christians for Christians. The book of Acts, the letters of Paul, uh, Hebrews, the, the, the general epistles, Revelation, are all written by Christians for other Christians. And so we wouldn't have a record of a prayer. For, you know, I, I keep praying for you that you'll know Jesus. Well, there is no you in the New Testament that's an unbeliever. The other reason that I think there's such uh, scant evidence of this is that it's just assumed like if you went to the early church and said, should we pray for unbelievers? I think they would look at you and be like, are you, st-? yes, <laughs> of course, of course we pray for unbelievers. Like how else are they going to know Jesus? Wait, do you think if I just go and talk to them that they're going to know Jesus? No, 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 no. Like the, the spirit has to go first. Prayer has to go first. Of course. So I do want to show you a couple of snippets, again, in the writings of Paul, where we get into this. One is in Romans chapter 10. And this is like the classic passage. He says, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Speaking about non-Christian Jews. My heart's desire for them is that they would be saved, and that's my prayer for them. Another is in uh, Colossians 4, where he says, at the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. What would happen if, when our church or a small group gathers and takes prayer requests, and we start scrolling through our minds trying to think, well, what should we put on the list? What if we started naming people in our lives who don't know Jesus? We need to start praying for this person. I want this person to know the love of my Savior. And then as a special subset of that, our children. If we started praying for our children to know Jesus, to give their lives to him as well. Now, she's going to be embarrassed when I say this, and I know this already. And I apologize in advance. But I think we could all stand to learn a lesson from Arlene in this. Arlene's been a part of our small group for two years now. And when we gather, it's the same thing every time. We have dinner for about an hour, and then we migrate to the living room, and we sit down, and we kind of have a little prayer request time. And, and then we study the Bible with whatever time is left. And routinely, Arlene comes and says... I want to pray for whoever, Matthew, or whoever it is that she was talking to at Walmart that week or at McDonald's. Uh, I met an unbeliever this week, and I was trying to share the gospel with him and pray for him. We could stand to learn a lesson from that. Do you know any unbelievers? Do, Do you know people who need to be saved, and are you praying for them to be saved? The mission of Poncha Springs Church of Christ is that we would participate with God in making and maturing disciples of Jesus. And that means that everything we do, including prayer, is geared toward making disciples as well as maturing disciples. And so if nothing else, I think prayer for the unbeliever puts evangelism on our radar so that the next time we see that person, oh, I've been praying for this person. I've been looking for an opportunity to share the gospel with this person. Because I think often we just, we're not even thinking about it, but when you start praying about it, I think it'll be on your radar. 
So here's what I want to try. And I have never done this before, and this may totally tank. And I'm prepared to deal with the consequences. Each of you should have an index card. If you don't have one, the girls, I'm sure, you just raise your hand up and they'll get you one. But I trust that they did a great job. I want you to write the name, and only the first name, privacy, or first initial if it's a really specific name that everyone's going to know who you're talking about. I want you to write the first name of an unbeliever that you will commit to praying for that they would be saved. And then when we're done this morning and we have this period where we're kind of mingling afterward, find a moment to go to the bulletin board and get a thumbtack and put their first name up. And I will pray for those names. And I would challenge you to pray for those names. Excuse me. Our small group will pray for those names. And I would challenge the other group to pray for those names. And by the grace of God, we will become a church that prays for the unbeliever. The third group of people that we pray for are our leaders. And there are two kinds of leaders that we should be praying for. The first kind of leader that we pray for is church leadership. Yeah, I don't take the task of, of trying to lead a church lightly. I know that I need you guys to be praying for me. Steve and Jerry and Wilson and Ben and Richards, we need you to pray for us. As we're talking about where this church is going, and as we're trying to equip the church and minister to the church and, and lead, we need you to pray for us. The writer of Hebrews says this right toward the end of his book. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their faith. So here's the deal. Jesus has given the church in every age apostles, by which uh, Paul means church planters, missionaries, people who go into new areas and start churches. Prophets, people who speak truth and call the church back to fidelity to their covenant with God. Evangelists, people who lead the way in evangelism. And pastors and teachers, people who preach and teach the word of God. And he's given these people to the church, Paul says this in Ephesians 4, for the purpose of mentoring us, equipping us, and shaping us to follow Jesus. And so I would ask that you'd pray for the, the church leadership the way that you would pray for any fellow believer. Wisdom, grow in faith, hope, and love, and righteousness. But then also pray for us as we try to lead the church and try to model Christ. The second kind of leader that we should pray for is what I'm calling civil leadership, and that's probably not the best term. Maybe uh, secular leadership, just non-church leadership. Church and non-church so this is government officials. This is uh, your boss at work. This is your teacher at school. This is a coach. This is whoever is in a position of authority. I want to show you one more verse. This one's from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, some of you I know are better at this than I am. I know this. But how should we pray for our leaders? Let me suggest a few ways that we would pray for our non-church leadership. First of all, we pray that we would be able to follow Christ in peace. 
And that, I'm just taking that straight out of the passage that we just read in 1 Timothy. Worldly leaders, whether that's legislators, police, teachers, bosses, whoever, whoever's in a position of authority are the ones who are making the rules and punishing those who break them. And so we pray concerning them, not that they would mandate our way of being in the world on everybody else, but that we would be able to follow Christ in peace with godliness. We pray essentially to be left alone to follow Jesus. Second of all, we pray that they would follow Christ themselves. We want them to know Jesus. Not because they're powerful and they will be able to use their powers for good and not evil. But we pray for them when they are unbelievers so that they would become believers and know Jesus. And so our prayer, like our fundamental, primary, most important thing that we pray for our leaders, whether that's President Trump or Governor Polis, is that they would know Jesus. And that under their tenure, we would be able to follow Christ in peace. That is our prayer. And then third, we pray for the well-being of our city. And that comes more from Jeremiah 29, verse 7. I think it's 7. More so than it does from 1 Timothy. We pray for the well-being of our city. For the flourishing and the health of our city. We pray for our schools. And for our businesses. When we pray for snow, it's not because we want to see green grass. It's because the whole economy of Salida is dependent on a good snowfall throughout the whole year. We pray for the economy. We pray for our hospital. We pray for crime to go down. Uh, We pray for the wholeness and the peace and the justice of our city. When I read the prayers of the early church, I see a stark contrast between the way that they prayed and the way that we often pray. But can you imagine what would happen if we started praying like this? If when we get together, if we prayed for one another, that we would have wisdom to follow Jesus and that we would grow in faith and hope and love and that we would be righteous and that those who are in our group or in our church would also grow in those ways. If we started praying for unbelievers by name, that they would come to know the love of Jesus. And if we started praying for our leaders, not just in church, but outside of church, that we would be able to follow Jesus in peace, that we would be left alone and that they themselves would come to know the power of grace. If we became a people of prayer who pray like that, I think God can accomplish immeasurably more than anything that we might ask or imagine. So in just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a closing prayer. And if you need to pray with someone or if you are thinking about being baptized, then you can come up and meet me up here. Let me close this in prayer. Our Father, we believe in you and we believe in your son, Jesus. We believe in your spirit. We believe that you forgive sins. And we ask that you forgive the sin of being too often short-sighted. Forgetting what, what we are all about. I thank you for this communion of saints, uh, for your church and I thank you for the love that's in this room, and I thank you for the faith that is in this room, and I pray that you will help us to walk wisely in your world, and that we would follow you purely and blamelessly. Please fill us with your spirit. Fill us with a spirit of wisdom and discernment so that we can know your will. Strengthen our faith with boldness to be your people in the city and and keep your hope in front of our eyes. We pray for the unbelievers whose names we have written down. The faces and the families that are represented on these cards. We pray that your spirit will go in front of us and begin to soften their hearts 
and convict them of their sin and begin to turn them toward your grace. We pray that you will fill us with boldness to then go and to speak to them and to draw them toward your son and to lead them into this this path toward you. We pray for the leaders of our church that you will give us wisdom and faith and hope and, and that we will love Uh, Not just your church, but that we would love even just one another. Uh, We pray that you'll help us to shepherd your people and to model the Christian walk in a worthy way and to equip your people to be ministers in this city. Uh, We pray for our other leaders, for our federal government and our state government and our local government. We pray for our teachers. We pray for our bosses. We pray that we would be able to follow you in peace. And we pray for those who don't know you that they would. We ask for the courage to accept the consequences of following you when it is not peaceful. And we pray that those who don't know you will encounter your son. We pray for our city that it will flourish in all these dimensions. We thank you for hearing our prayer and we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. And we pray this in the power of your spirit. And all your church says, I love you guys.